panelists, uh, please come to the stage. Um, before everybody sits down, I want to uh, just remind everyone uh, the evaluation forms are in your packet and they are color coded in order to receive lunch. Um, you must complete the white and the pink form and turn them in for admission for lunch. Uh, lunch will be distributed next door in ballroom A after this plenary and the youth performance. Lunch is included in your registration, so it is free. Uh, well, not without the evaluation form. Um, and if you need evaluation form, go outside there and um, you will be able to get one. I also want to remind everyone, uh, again, my name is Lisa fager Bediaco. I'm with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And um, <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I want to remind everyone, we are on Facebook at Who Can You Tell? We are also on Twitter, Who Can You Tell? Young people, you're tweeting. Um, and also hashtag HIV stigma. Uh, if you're taking pictures and mentioning the conference, we really appreciate it. And so I'm just going to begin. Are we good? Can I just talk? Oh, oh okay. That sounds good. Um, we're going to begin our discussion today by looking at how government agencies and community-based organizations are addressing stigma by developing and implementing in invent interventions that work. Please welcome our panelists to the stage. I will give very brief bios and want to remind everyone they are in, the bios are in the program booklet and for those watching online, please go to the website whocanyoutell.org and also read the bios online. All right. Um, I'm going to go, I think, because I'm so sure that St. We're going to give St. Elmo a round of applause because he is the man who does everything. Um, he also does my conference, so he's live streaming, doing audio visual. He is a one man show. Um, and so, with that said, I want to bring up there's someone who wants to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Marguerite Nita. Uh, she is the interim dean of College of Nursing and Allied Health Sciences at here at Howard University. Please welcome her, Doctor. Uh, good morning, and uh, this is an amazing conference, and I'm pleased to have been invited. Um, I'm going to just steal two minutes of time to tell a story, very briefly, of a young man who uh, I knew as a, when I was a teaching assistant uh, in graduate school. And this was in 1981, I ran into him again. I had... Um, finished grad school, and I was pregnant with my first child, and I ran into him in the hospital. And of course, he was a great student, brilliant young man, beautiful, and I ran to hug him, and he stepped back. And I was like, oh, well, you know, it's been a couple of years, so maybe I, we were closer than I thought we were. Um, so it's fine, you know, we greeted each other and then I walked away and I found out a few months later that he had died alone and um, unwanted by his family at DC General Hospital because he had AIDS. And that story has stuck with me all these years because I often wish that I had known that he had AIDS because I would have gone to visit him. So he wouldn't have been so much alone. But uh, the stigma persists today. And it uh, has taken on many complexities. I was talking to Nancy earlier this morning about her talk. And um, I thought, wow, there's always something more that's used to stigmatize people. Her talk will be um, on the barrier to HIV prevention and a persistent negative bias and stigma related to treating opioid dependence. Uh, Dr. Murphy is a new assistant professor at uh, Howard University in the um, graduate nursing program. She has moved here from New York. And if you talk to her even for a few minutes, you detect the passion and the conviction she has 
about treating individuals with opioid dependency and the relationship that that has to HIV infection. And so uh, I ask you to welcome uh, Dr. Nancy Murphy, and we look forward to her talk. Thank you. Well, I'm really delighted to be here. And um, as you've just heard, uh, I am new here to DC. I am new here to Howard, um, but I'm not new to HIV care. And um, everything that I heard today, um, I graduated nursing school my first um, in 1982. And I worked in a hospital on a surgical floor where there were people with this condition that people didn't know what it was where they were isolated and people, everything I just heard today just brought back all of these stories. And we all have stories. People used to take the trays, the food, and open the door and kick the tray into the room because they didn't want to go in. Gown and glove, it had not, it, so 30 years now later, uh, the work continues. Um, and, you know, as a clinician working in the field of HIV, uh, you know, one of our major goals, of course, is to treat um, people with HIV so that they can live healthy lives. And um, in addition to treating already established uh, infections, clinicians can also work simultaneously to prevent new HIV infections, um, which brings me to the topic of my presentation, which is the treatment of opioid dependence addiction as HIV prevention. And rele it, that's relevant to this conference is the ongoing persistent negative biases and stigma related to treating this condition, which in turn is being a barrier to HIV prevention, which in turn is a barrier to improving health outcomes. Um, so let me just give, uh, for those who may or may not know, just a little brief overview about opioids. Opioids are, um, and also opioid dependence addiction, opioids are a class of drugs or medications, prescription pain pills, heroin. I think people have heard in the, the media over the last, you know, five or more, ten years, increased use of opioids, pain medications, increased um, uh, overdoses, increased all kinds of harms related to this. Um, and opioid dependence addiction is actually defined first by physical dependence, where people have um, tolerance and withdrawal, but it's also in combination with features. Um, most significant is the compulsive or loss of control of the use of opioids despite ongoing harm. Um, especially for people who inject opioids, the physical, social, um, legal harms um, can be tremendous, particularly HIV, hepatitis C. So like condoms and syringe exchange, needle exchange, treating opioid dependence can prevent um, the occurrence of new HIV infections. So as a clinician uh, working in New York City, and um, I was working as an HIV primary care provider for many years, and then I uh, entered into my uh, doctoral work, you know, I, I wanted to, of course, learn to become a researcher and also to, you know, figure out what could I do that would be uh, important. And so... I was able to develop and implement with a team of my colleagues at the place where I was working an interdisciplinary buprenorphine treatment practice. And people may know the word buprenorphine, or it's uh, that's the generic name. The, the product name is Suboxone. And this is a new, it's not that new, but it's still not really widely used, relatively new, maybe about 10 years um, treatment for opioid dependence. And what's significant is that it certainly has a safer and um, profile than methadone, although methadone is, you know, a good treatment as well. But the spectacular component of this is that this can be used to treat opioid dependence in office-based settings. And this drives to the point, to me, of this conference, is that when a person can go into an office and close their door and be with their clinician and have the dignity to have treatment for their condition, just like they would their diabetes and their asthma and their hypertension. This is very much what treating people in office-based settings is about. And to bring this care to 
the larger community for people who either don't have access to methadone or for whatever reason, um, some of the structure of methadone treatment programs may be um, not what patients want. Um, so I worked with people, we put together this whole uh, interdisciplinary treatment practice and we integrated it within HIV primary care at a designated aid center in New York City which is all good because many of you know this is congruent with the Affordable Care Act, which has given mental health and substance use